time that notice was received in Senate by the Speaker on the 9th of October 2024, notices were issued to the petitioner to file all the documents as prescribed and to defend himself with every question that was raised in the National Assembly, which, I know you recall, had voted by 282 members to impeach the deputy president. The right of fair trial, fair administrative action under Article 47, and the right to a fair hearing were therefore preserved. And I will just demonstrate as I move on to show that once the 16th and the 17th were gazetted at the dates when the deputy president would be had, and that would be the Wednesday and Thursday of October 2024, the motion, the seven day period when motions and pleadings were exchanged <coughs> and commenced. And all parties were aware that the Senate investigations would take two days. Your Ladyship and my Lords, parties were then invited to respond to every allegation. This was a two tire trial, my Lords. The National Assembly, sitting as the initial uh, chamber that received the impeachment motion, voting in the affirmative for the impeachment motion, no brainer. The Senate, as a trial chamber, my Lord, Articles 94 and 95, uh, donating powers to Senate and to the National Assembly, respectively. The Senate then proceeded to afford an opportunity. And I want to just demonstrate, my Lord, that Article 1 2 of the Constitution designates Senate as the National Assembly as speaking for the people under Article 1. Because the people may either access their power directly or through their elected representatives. So my Lord must read the Constitution in the sense that the Constitution then, speaking through the people, Senate was the trial chamber that undertook the trial as by the Constitution contemplated. My Lord, what happened on the 16th was the commencement of the trial. And it's important to respond to this part of the question. That the petitioner participated in the entire trial. Only the petitioner, my lords, had the opportunity to cross-examine all the witnesses presented by the National Assembly that presented this case before the Senate. Senate sitting as a trial chamber as a whole, and therefore as a quasi-judicial body. Each senator, considering the allegations and bundles, served to every senator uh, prior to the trial. My lords, it was on the 17th, and this is an important distinction, at 2.30 p.m. after Senator that joined at 1.15 p.m., that Senior Counsel Paul Mutin presented to Senate an adjournment on the basis that he could not trace the petition of the Deputy President at the time. He informed the Senate that he had learned of his client's illness, but did not read it. He then sought an adjournment to 5 p.m. He had two and a half hours to trace his client. My Lord, there's a curious point here, and this is an important my Lord. The provisions of Article 145, 5, and 6, and I want to refer to those articles, provide, my Lord, that after an impeachment hearing before Senate, a party may be represented, 1455, the president, the deputy president, <coughs> shall have the right to appear and be represented before the special committee during investigations. This article was wholly satisfied because the deputy president was present throughout 
the tribe. But then Article 145, 6, A and B then step in. If the claims have been substantiated, the Senate shall, after according the President, an opportunity to be had, vote on the impeachment charges. And the Senate accorded the Deputy President an opportunity to be had. How was that accorded, my Lord? That was accorded, my Lord, first to be had through the splitting files in Senate. That is one. But number two, my Lord, he was present during the entire presentation of the case of the National Assembly. But third, my Lord, he was given and accorded an adjournment at 2.30, from 1 p.m. to 2.30. At 2.30, he was accorded an adjournment to come back at 5 p.m. My Lord, what happened at 5 p.m. is summarized at paragraphs 25 to 28 of our submissions, and it goes like this. Mm -hmm. At 5 p.m., my Lord, the Deputy President, the Council for the Deputy President, Senior Council Paul Mwite, submitted or told Senate that he could not trust his client, but that he had been admitted at Karen Oscar. He neither presented a medical report nor a report from any doctor. And that is an important observation. But beyond failing to present any document to demonstrate the truthfulness of the health status of the Deputy President, my Lord, Council and his team, Senior Council Paul Mutter, Eminent Council Elisha Boyer, and the entire team proceeded to walk out. And why did they proceed to walk out, my Lord? Perhaps they did not read the wording of the Constitution and all the standing orders. Because our party, my Lord, may be presented or may be present at trial by himself or through an advocate or representative. In this case, my Lord, every opportunity was presented to the respondents to present, but they opted, my Lord, not to proceed and not to provide any document to say at that point to my Lord, uh, uh, confirm my Lord at the point that their client or the deputy president that matter was unwell and admitted. Senate then proceeded, my Lord, to vote on that question. My Lord, this is where standing order 85 comes in and rule 6 and 7. I will, I will elaborate. Number one, my Lord, understanding order 85. Senators on a procedure of motion may vote by acclamation. That vote was carried and Senate then voted to proceed. My Lord, the catch here is rule 12 of the rules that govern the proceedings. Once the 16th and the 17th of October 2024 were gazetted as the days that we have to proceed, that Senate proceeded, my Lord, the proceedings had to be sequential and could not be stopped because of the requirement that the proceedings were time-bound and were to conclude in 10 days. The last day, my Lord, that the proceedings were to conclude was the Saturday, the next day. My Lord, unfortunately, council, senior council meeting, and the, the answer to demonstrate this, my Lord, had applied for an adjournment to the following Tuesday. My Lord, we, we have demonstrated that the Petitioner dragged the carpet from his own feet, deliberately decided to sabotage his own appearance when he had been in court for the in, in, in Senate for the last two days up to 1.15 p.m. before deciding not to be reachable by his entire team and the team making trust by his attorney. My Lord, my Lord and relation. The petitioner had taken part in the cross-examination of all the parties. No case, my Lord, has been presented before you that one, there was a violation of the standing orders of Senate. That's my point. Number two, that Senate did not consider some material defense to any of the charges that were proffered against the deputy president. My Lord, I just want to, uh, for clarity of thought, submit that even on the submission that Malayan friends 
Mr. Masharia made before this court, this court, that there was additional evidence that was entertained by the speaker under Rule 6 and 7 by hearing a witness called Mr. Njomo. I remember that submission, my lord. My lord, that was a substantiation of a charge on economic crimes that failed. Only, my lord, five out of the 11 charges proffered against the deputy president petitioner hearing succeeded. Only five out of the 11 charges. How else can Senate have been judicious with throughout six charges? None of the petitions brought before you seems to commend Senate for standing its high ground and throwing out six of the charges. And that is what good faith uh, uh, would mean, my lord. That out of the six charges, my lord, my lord, the deputy president was convicted on the gross violation of articles 10 to AB 27 and 129 on the shareholding remark. He was also convicted on the other grounds on national cohesion and on the question that is live before this court, my lord, that is on violating this code that requires him to undertake certain functions and undermining the function of the National Security Intelligence Service. Ms. Kimodo of Kimodo and Company Advocates would want the Deputy President to apologize on that count. That's a live matter. But my lord, in the grant of conservator orders, I submit, and this is because I argued Munya, I argued Wajira, I argued Munya, I argued Martin. So I'm, I'm an authority. <laughs> yes. And I was with you, Professor. And on, <laughs> Professor in the, on the, the principles that the court considered, the Supreme Court considered in the Bunya case, but public interest, I think, on the scales weighed highest that this court must take into account the import of a conservatory order issued ex parte against public interest. <coughs> My Lord, this is a country that is built on the constitution of Kenya in 2010 with a president whose powers are defined under article 131 of the constitution. And article 131 as a writer, that the president's role as the chief executive of the country shall be performed by himself directly and through delegation by the deputy president. This country, therefore, cannot contemplate an interregnum. That means space of power. An interregnum is not contemplated by the Constitution. The position of the deputy president, my lord and my lady, must therefore be filled at all times. And that is why the applicants know well that this country must move on and have a deputy president sworn in because of the dictates of Article 131 of the Constitution. My lady and my lords, a conservatory order is therefore inconceivable in the terms defined in the Munya case. A conservatory order of the nature issued by Justice Mwongo is not only is not only unfeasible, but flies in the face of principles of public interest. <coughs> the interest in Meru County then was to avoid an interregnum in the governance structure so that Meru County could not collapse. And we took the bold measure to go to court at that time to protect them. This court would only use that authority to support the appointment of His Excellency Honorable Professor Kivuretu. So that this country moves to the second level. I would like you to discharge the conservative order on that principle alone, that the wider public interest is greater than the interest of the former Deputy President of the Republic. But where wherein would his remedies lie 
but I friend your body will submit. If it is a salary of one month, that would be compensable by damages. If it is a week salary, that is six that I should have been or to have been deputy president, that would be compensated in my attempt. But this country, the Lord, cannot be at a standstill and be held through litigation because we need to have that position filled. The Lord, if I move to the other point, my Lord, we have submitted that since every opportunity was afforded to the deputy president to present his case, and that he failed to present his case, my Lord, every argument before this court, every argument before this court by Malani friends on the import of the processes of an impeachment fall on their back. They fall on their back, my lord, because the authority in my movie Sonko and Nairobi City County Assembly, and I'm, again I argued this one. Lord. In fact, I was in this one. In this case, my lord, the impeachment was upheld. In this case, my movie Sonko had sought to hold the process leading to the impeachment because there were no reasons given for the impeachment. The Court of Appeal rightly stated that one, there was the answer that contained reasons. Two, my Lord, in terms of an impeachment, my Lord, Mike Mubison was challenging the approach where the Senate sat as a whole, as a committee of the vote. The court finding that that is an option that is open to Senate and cannot speak to the lawfulness or otherwise. Council on the other side submitted that there was need for a committee. Senate, in its proceedings, my Lord, in its wisdom, had voted to proceed through the whole house and accorded the petitioner all his rights that were due to him at the initial stage only for the petition to petitioner not to avail himself to take advantage of the second opportunity to be had. My Lord, we submit, my Lord, that unless the processes of Senate are faulted by my landed friends, the impeachment became final when the vote was taken before midnight on the 17th. And His Excellency, the Deputy President, the Gad de Gashagwa, stood impeached henceforth. Unfortunately, my lords, this is an impeachment which has no comeback. It is like a death. You have died. You can't come back to life. But you can have certain claims in succession. <laughs> and that is why we have the law of succession. Rights and remedies then come into question. <coughs> My Lord, set aside the conservative orders. Let us move on, my lords. The bigger public interest tilts in favor of the appointment of His Excellency Professor Kidure Indiki. A very good man. Thank you. My Lord and my lady, my name is Mondomi Dimukolu for the second interested party. <coughs> and to that end, we have filed a notice of preliminary objection. Detail of October, the year 2024. We have, in addition to that, filed a list and bundle of authorities on that preliminary objection, and that list and bundle is dated the 25th day of October, 2024, and pursuant to your directions, those are the bundles, my Lord, that we suggest you hold them close to you because of referring to 
for them shortly. <coughs> we have, in addition, filed written submissions, skeleton submissions dated the 27th day of October 2024. Before I delve into the PO, my love, a suggestion was made to you. I forgot to tell you, my lord, that I am here for the second interest in party together with my learned friend, Mr. Stephen Obola. Before I go to the PO, my lord, a number of things were said by my friends and learned friends. I mean it because we are both friends in addition to being learned. One of the things you are told is to laugh at me for raising this PO. The other thing you were told is that uh, the PO was determined in some rulings and directions you issued. And our simple answer, my lord, is that unless I'm mistaken, observations made by the court at the expert stage before full benefit of argument from all sides cannot be the subject of a submission that the issue is settled. But if you listen to me while we have raised this PO, and you find that I deserve to be laughed at, it's okay. My Lord, we, our PO makes only three interrelated points. The point number one, which you'll find in paragraph one of our written submission, is that the High Court's jurisdiction under Article 23, which governs human rights litigation, and Article 165, which is about enforcement of the Constitution to confirm whether anything. I'm here to tell you very shortly, my Lord, the word anything does not actually mean anything in the literal sense, and specifically to tell you that your jurisdiction under that Article 165 does not extend to disputes as to the impeachment of the president and the deputy president. Yes, the court has jurisdiction to enforce human rights. The court has jurisdiction to confirm whether anything allegedly done in the name of the constitution is constitutional. But our submission is that that apparently very broad jurisdiction does not extend to a dispute as to the impeachment of the president or the deputy president of the department. And that is the point made in paragraph one all the way to seven of our preliminary objection. Number two, point number two. This court, and indeed all other courts of the Republic of Kenya, have no jurisdiction to entertain a dispute as to the impeachment of the president and the deputy president. But if we are wrong in that submission, my lord, because I have been wrong many times, we make the submission that the only court that would conceivably, arguably, mark my words, conceivably and arguably, our jurisdiction on this dispute is the Supreme Court. And that is the subject of paragraph 8 of our preliminary objection. <coughs> Why do we say that this court, though we acknowledge its broad jurisdiction and that's both 23 and 165, does not extend to presidential impeachment disputes. The reasons, my lord, are set in paragraph six of our submission. And the simple point is this, that our constitution denies this court, the high court jurisdiction, on countless matters that would fall under chapter four on the Bill of Rights. Case in point, presidential elections involve human rights under Article 38. 
it is clear in the constitution that this court has no jurisdiction of a decision relating to a presidential election. Even if someone was to come here and say that he was denied his article 38, which is a human right at the direct election. My Lord, it is clear by things of article 58 sub article 5 that this court has no jurisdiction to hear a dispute as to a declaration of a state of emergency. My Lord and friend, Mr. Nguyen talks of the world, this is how we are all sufficiently decent to acknowledge that nothing invades the entire regime of human rights and a declaration of emergency. That declaration can affect the right to assembly, to expression, to fiscal legislation. And yet the Constitution is clear if you have a dispute as to that matter. Never mind it, it has abrogated the entire Bill of Rights. The court you go to is not the High Court, it is the Supreme Court. And now, property is a matter of the Bill of Rights, Article 40. <coughs> it is clear from our Article 162 that if you have a problem in that regard, or to do with the environment, which is also a human rights matter, you go to the environment and land court. So, my Lord, I'm here very humbly to tell you the mere fact that someone has run to you screaming Article 23, Article 165, does not, without no meaning, that this court has jurisdiction to hear that matter. In other words, my Lord, for you to exercise jurisdiction over this matter, you've been told many matters, and as far as we are concerned, the matter before you, the substratum, is the impeachment. These things you've been told about Professor Kindiki are diversionaries or subsidiaries, because without the impeachment, we will not be talking about Kindiki. So the substratum of the dispute before you is impeachment. And our point, my Lord, in the absence of an express grant of jurisdiction on this court, on the substratum of this district, on the subject of this district, which reminds me of Professor Gideon Wege's issue about this disability, then you have no jurisdiction. Luckily, my Lord, I hope we all agree that there is no clause of our constitution that confers on this court jurisdiction to entertain the dispute before you. Which means, therefore, the question is whether, nonetheless, you have that jurisdiction, given your broad powers and that's to 23 and 165. Luckily, my Lord, our constitution was the product of a 20-year process that we call the constitutional process. And because it is in black and white, I invite you to go to page 5 of our Bible, my Lord, the Bible of authorities. We have produced, rather before you, extract of the Bomber's Constitutional, the Bomber's Draft Constitution. It confirms to us, if you go to page 6 with me, that during the constitutional process, Kenyans actually agonized over whether this matter should be handled in the court and which court. And it's there in black and white, at 187 on page 6. It says the Supreme Court shall have exclusive, that must mean to the exclusion of every other court, including this one, a Roman II, this is arising from the process of the impeachment of the president. So when we were having our debate through the bombers process, there was a decision, it's there in black and white, that there will be judicial review, not before this court, but in the Supreme Court. Of course we know, my lord, the bombers draft was one of many. The next draft that was generated in that process is at page 7 of our Bible. 
the harmonized draft constitution. At page 8, again, clause 4, 1 of that draft constitution, it is clear there in Article 201, so by Article 4, that the Supreme Court has, paragraph A, exclusive, at the line, exclusive. We move from that document, and likely my lords, the bench, to me, should be familiar with this process, to a document that went to the 2005 referendum, which was the worker draft. We are producing at page 10 of our battle. This document is special, my lord, in the sense that it was subjected to a referendum before the people of Kenya. And again, you find there at 184, Kenyans were still toying with the idea that the courts can interfere in this process. But what I want to mark again on page 11 is that the court that had been envisioned is the Supreme Court, not the High Court. We all, of course, know that draft was rejected by the people of Kenya, and that must mean, because this is a draft that reached the referendum, that the people of Kenya also rejected this rule of judicial intervention in this problem before you. Why do I say so? The next document is now the official constitution we have today, which is the Constitution of Kenya 2010. And it has no clause conferring jurisdiction on this court or even the Supreme Court. And still that rule was always on the table, my lord, but was dropped from the final draft. We must take it that the final decision the people of Kenya made at the referendum of 2010 was that there would be no judicial intervention in the dispute of the nature before you. You are told that we have cited that for 144, yet it is irrelevant. Let's see shortly whether it's irrelevant. We have produced that for 144 on page 13 of our battle. My lord and my lady, you can only remove the president and the deputy president through two routes. Either the route of Article 144 or Article 145. We are only mentioning 144 to help us answer in the absence of express jurisdiction whether there is inferred jurisdiction. And when you check 144, one of the curious rules, it, it tells you 144, at 144, 8 of our constitution, is that the report of the tribunal shall be final and not subject to appeal. And if the tribunal reports that the president is capable of performing the functions uh, of the office, the speaker shall also communicate. And of course, it goes on to all of that. If they find the president is either insane or suffers an infirmity of body, then the Senate shall vote. Something curious here, my lord, that our Senate can vote to retain a president found by a medical tribunal to be insane, and our constitution says that decision cannot be challenged in any court or tribunal. Those are not my words. But more curiously, this rule is also repeated, my lord, in 165, and for me, what is most appealing, my lord, is uh, you know the constitution speaks to an issue once. It has spoken about this issue of 144 in 144 9. And when you go to 165 again, it says this court has jurisdiction to hear an appeal from a tribunal removal from office, except the tribunal under 144. I don't know, but it must count for something that those who drafted our constitution decided to deny jurisdiction not just once, but twice. So the million dollar question, my lord, if this court has been denied jurisdiction twice for the process under Article 144, 
on what basis can it assume jurisdiction for a process under Article 145 in the absence of express confirmation of that jurisdiction and in the face of the multiple ousters I took you to, where the constitution says in black and white, this matter may be about the constitution, this matter may be about the Bill of Rights, but the High Court has no jurisdiction. That's what we mean when we say in our PO, my Lord, that the Supreme Court jurisprudence in this country, I'm addressing you now, on the authority in advisory opinion number two, I believe, of 2011. I don't know whether Professor Tom Ojeda was involved. <laughs> <laughs> but my Lord, we are told in that decision that jurisdiction cannot be arrogated through the craft of interpretation. What the petitioner and those in support of his cause are inviting the High Court to do is to arrogate to itself jurisdiction of a dispute or by the impeachment of the president through the craft of interpretation, through the craft of steel, through the craft of sophistry. Jurisdiction is something the court either has or does not have. It cannot be inferred. Professor Jim is telling me other things one must, must either have or not have, there is no middle ground. But I suppose he wants me to fall into trouble with the court, so I won't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> but look, let's go to the decision in Nixon versus United States, which is at page 28. Again, you are told to laugh at me because this decision is from the 19th century, I will invite you to note it's a decision issued in the year 1993. I was in upper primary school in 1993, and my students say I'm still fairly young. So this is not a decision from the 19th century, my Lord. But I also want to point to you, 1993 is so recent coming from the United States, a country that has had a constitution running for close to 300 years, now and counting. Why this decision is important, my Lord, is several reasons. One, it is a decision from the United States Supreme Court. Two, our law on impeachment, and I hope again we have to quote my good friend Don Boyer, the decency to agree that it is from the United States Constitution we borrow that 144 and 145. Even if you take the rule now in this rule, rule 11 here, rule 11 in this decision of the Senate. So this decision, to the extent that it comes from the highest court of the country from which we got this idea now before your impeachment, must surely be persuasive, even if not binding on you. But more importantly, it is all about impeachment. What happened in this decision, my lord, is quite interesting. The person who had been impeached was a judge of a federal court in the U.S. He was sent to prison, but refused to resign from his judicial office. And because in the U.S. did his old office for life to the extent that he refused to resign, it meant the U.S. Treasury was bound to continue paying his salary and the monuments while he was in jail. And of course, our sympathy was not going to be let go. The United States Parliament, called Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate, took up impeachment and impeached this judge. <coughs> but when you follow the whole thing in this case, my lord, they say at page 20 of our Bible that a controversy is non-justiciable where there is a textually demonstrable constitutional commitment of the issue to a coordinate political department of government. Or when you lack judicially discoverable or manageable standards or remedies for resolving it. 
I don't need to believe at the point when you read the case, the Songko case, and the Wagora case, that is exactly what our Supreme Court has said. Following this decision that impeachment is textually committed. Those are not my words. They are the words of the Supreme Court of the US, the Supreme Court of the Republic of Kenya. And my Lord, we submit under Article 144, or rather 145, impeachment is textually committed to the Senate. But they also say the language and structure of the Constitution confirm that textual commitment of this dispute. <coughs> More importantly, which is what the Attorney General, Emeritus Professor Bogey, you go to page 21, my love, you are told that disability is also refuted by the lack of finality inherent in exposing the country's political life particularly if the president were impeached for months or perhaps years of chaos during the visual review of Senate. We already know I've been telling you how the other side wants to grind the wheels. We are told by the Supreme Court, my lord, this sector of the country being held on tenterhooks as this matter is fought here, is fought in the Court of Appeals. The average lifespan of a case in our Court of Appeals is three to five years the last time I checked then going to the Supreme Court, we are being told the political life of a country cannot be held at ransom awaiting judicial determination. And more importantly, lastly, because my seniors are telling me I've been talking too much uh, so that I take my seat before they reprimand me, I want to refer you to page 32 of our budget. And the reason I'm referring it to you, my Lord, is many people will genuinely be shocked by this idea that a dispute like this is not justiciable. But there are good policy reasons for it. And if you read our page that which is that decision in Nixon versus United States, it tells you in black and white, there are sufficient safeguards embedded in the Constitution, including majorities, minimum voting thresholds required at every stage of that process, including the holding of a trial, including calling and cross-examination of witnesses. And because those safeguards, especially at the Senate, are in the nature of a trial, that's why Chief Justice Zankwini tells us here that nobody should have to make every weather of the idea that this type of dispute is not justiciable. Lastly, you were told about political question doctrine and many things. I will invite you to note the courts of Kenya in those this doctrine as early as 205. Uh, again, the authorities on page 51 of our bado. I don't have time to take you through it. We have produced the song court decisions. We have the citations, the quotes we've listed in our written submissions. And all we are telling you, my Lord, when all is said and done, is to do either of two things. Hold you have no jurisdiction. The consequence would be that these petitions must be struck out. The conservatory order must fall by the wayside, having been issued by a court lacking jurisdiction. But if my Lord find that too heavy and too radical, and therefore I'm acceptable to this court, I am giving you the alternative. If we must infer jurisdiction, because that's what you're being asked, let's infer it at the Supreme Court, which is the global practice, so that the matter is held uh, of this nature is that once and for all, without subjecting the country's political life. That is the public interest we have just been told from the Supreme Court of the United States. That's so all there is a question for me. Thank you.
My name is Melimo. My Lord, I'm here to address you on three grounds. Specifically, my Lord, one on public participation. The second issue, my Lord, I'll be addressing you on is fair hearing. With a reference, my Lord, to the National Assembly. And lastly, on the nominee, my Lord, the Deputy Presidential nominee. My Lord, on the first point of public participation, you shall not pass, my Lord, that there is no one in the petition before you who has alleged that they were denied an opportunity to participate in the public participation exercise. The second point, my Lord, is that it is common ground to all the parties that public participation was an essential ingredient in the impeachment proceedings. And that is, my Lord, dictated by Article 118B of the Constitution. And, my Lord, on the boxes to be ticked in reference to the public participation exercise, I invite you, my Lord, to refer to the Supreme Court BAT decision. And specifically, my Lord, at page 45 of that decision, which we have attached, my Lord, to the first respondent's supplementary list and bundle of authorities, dated 28 of this month. My Lord, the second authority that I will refer you to on matters of public participation is the recent authority, my Lord, that was rendered last week by the High Court in the affordable housing decision, my Lord, that is position number A154 of 2024, and specifically, my Lord, at pages 178 to 179. Rather to 184 of that decision. My Lord, if you are to refer to the reply of the of the National Assembly, you will note that the National Assembly, my Lord, undertook an unprecedented public participation exercise. None of that nature and magnitude, my Lord, has been undertaken in the history of this country. And my Lord, I will refer you to the annexed public participation report. And specifically, my Lord, at pages 427 to 555 of the reply in of the National Assembly. And my Lord, very quickly, you note that over 224,000 people. Not over 224,000 people were involved in the exercise, where they volunteered to give their views. And out of course, a lot you shall note that 65% of the people who rendered their views were in support of the motion. Is this submission for the lifting of orders on for or for uh, petition. My, my, my Lord, I'm, I'm trying to establish the fact that any way that was made, my Lord, on the fact that there was no fact. We have made those very letters, but you know, we need to be, because we are all lawyers and judges, we need to be specific to the courts. You know, some of the things that you say here are actually not meant for this court. We've been trying not to intervene, but you know that the brothers, a lot of submissions which have been made here are not for the proceedings today. They are meant for another proceeding. So if we can just avoid them, the better for us. Yes, my Lord, I stand by it. And then another, another one, Mr. Medina, you may spare us the submission on the sufficiency of the public participation. Correct. Yes, my, my Lord, I, I stand guided and I was just going, my Lord, to refer to one authority that we had, uh, my Lord, attached uh, as authority number one 
in the supplementary list of authorities, if you are to look at page 4 of that authority, my lord, the sufficiency or otherwise of public participation access, my lord, is to be determined at the main trial. And my lord, therefore, I would agree with you that all I need to do, my lord, is to refer you to the report that I've been giving, my lord, that it appears at page 427, specifically the finding, my lord, to 455 of the reply of the report. But my lord, allow me just to pick one thing out of that report. You are particularly, my lord, referred to one of the constituencies, specifically, my lord, the EU South constituency. Where my line colleague, my lord, raised issues that indeed the figures do not tie. My lord, first, you shall note that the figures that were quoted by the petition, my lord, are contained nowhere in the public participation report that have been submitted before. I don't want to believe that my line colleagues got that information from sources other than the reports that were submitted at the National Assembly. My Lord, can you South uh, views, my Lord, are submitted are to be found firstly at page 289 of the report, my Lord, and it appears at, as item number 95. And this goes specifically, my Lord, to the hand delivered and email views where it was indicated that, my Lord, there was a total of 465 responses and out of, out of those, my Lord, 455 were in support. That is what, my Lord, is contained in the report as the first link. The second link, my Lord, is for those who participated in the public hearings of the 4th, my Lord, of October and is found at page 331. Same KU South constituency. And my Lord, it's indicated that a total of 355 people did, my Lord, attend that public hearing. And out of those, 352 persons, my Lord, supported the motion. Lastly, on that point, my Lord, is to refer you to page 440 of the reply and affidavit. My Lord, where you shall not, not 440, my Lord, I'm sorry, page 439, where, my Lord, you shall note that the total responses in respect of the EU South constituency were 820. And that out of those, my Lord, in support were 8 or 7. So, my Lord, the views are submitted, or the submissions are submitted by my Lord's colleagues, my Lord, do not find any favor in the report. And therefore, my Lord, I'll urge you that you do ignore that. My Lord, I also need to point out that public participation, my Lord, is not a referendum. As well understood, my Lord. And that in the words, my Lord, of your learned brother, justice and sisters, my Lord, in the affordable housing decision, public participation does not, my Lord, necessarily mean that everyone in the country must give their opinions. My Lord, that is paragraph 175 of the affordable housing decision. And that, my Lord, all that the National Assembly was required to do, at paragraph 176, is to give the public an opportunity, my Lord, to submit their views. And my Lord, you shall note that in the report, all that was done by the National Assembly. And therefore, in the following of the time, my Lord, we shall demonstrate before you that there is absolutely no agricultural point and the public participation exercise that was conducted, my Lord, by the National Assembly was not only meaningful, but was sufficient both qualitatively and quantitatively. My Lord, the other issue that was raised was by my learned colleague, Mr. Mario, on public participation, where he indicated, my Lord, that elections are conducted at the polling stations. My Lord, that submission is not true. The presidential, my Lord, elections are provided for in terms of being conducted, my Lord, at Article 138.2, where it says, my Lord, that the elections are at the constituency level and not at the polling station. 
And the other issue that arose from the submissions from my running colleagues is whether my lord, the first petitioner was given an opportunity to present his reply to the public prior to the public participation. My lord, my answer to that is simple. That first, my lord, the public participation exercise commenced on 2nd of October all the way to 5th. And my lord, by the time the public participation commenced, the first petitioner had no 